I'm going to talk to you about how to uh, understand and apply innovation strategies into organizations. So I want to talk to you about management innovation techniques. You have standard management techniques, budgeting, human resource management, performance measurement, and so on. In the case of innovation, we talk about strategic planning, which is also, by the way, a standard management tool. It actually crosses both uh, fields the way we've defined it. Re-engineering, quality management, benchmarking, team management, and outsourcing. And we'll spend a whole week uh, on outsourcing itself. So sustainability management uh, and innovation. Innovation is about creative management that makes organizations more agile, effective, and efficient. Sounds nice, right? Improving the sustainability of an operation is difficult due to the persistence of short-term thinking. So part of what you're trying to do as an innovator in sustainability is bring about a longer-term perspective. The need for immediate results and the lack of understanding of how sustainability can actually help an organization's bottom line uh, leads to opposition. Also, the persistence of standard operating procedures. Once people learn how to do something, and they are reluctant to change it because it's always worked. Uh, in the data farm example that you heard before, uh, people that run data centers like redundancy. They like extra energy use because the only real sanction they have is the thing breaks. It doesn't work. So if it costs a lot of money and energy to keep it running, that's OK. Um, organizations have what I call organizational gravity, which is that even if you have a period of creative innovation and sort of this little lift to the organization, eventually it sort of regresses back uh, to perhaps not the old way, but a new old way of doing things. Because people get a little tired of change. They like to show up at work, get their coffee, do the same routine that they do every other day. And they don't like it when somebody says, we're in a challenging environment, got to change things frequently. You know, uh, it's uncomfortable. It's annoying. Who needs it? OK? But in the world we're in, uh, it's inevitable. And of course, these sustainability issues are going to be challenges for a long time. Now, I often talk about management as a craft and not a science. And what I mean by that is, why do we have two groups give presentations of the same case if there's a right answer? It's because there is no right answer. It's a craft. One person crafts a solution that works in some settings and not in another. Uh, a craftsperson might make a very comfortable chair for one person to the next person who gives them a backache. OK, that's what a craft's about. It's trying to figure it out for the situation you're in. Now, in the, case, in the course of this semester, we looked at management tools one at a time. We looked at sustainability issues one at a time. But in fact, when you solve problems in the real world, they come at you all the time, and you don't get to choose which tool or which, which issue you have to deal with. You have to simply respond and frame your response to what's happening in front of you. You don't get to do it. you know one strategy at a time. You have to use them in combination. And so for some of what we're doing in a class is always a little bit artificial. So when I think about uh, management innovation or tools in general, I think about tools that influence an organization's environment, tools that influence an organization's people, tools for managing the organization's financial resources, and tools for influencing the organization's operations. Those are the kinds of things that we are either trying to keep intact or, or to change. So when you think about the environment, you've got strategic planning, you've got outsourcing and leveraging partnerships, and you have political management, advertising, trying to change the environment by the messages you send to it. For the organization's people, you have the overall field of human resource management, you have communications, interpersonal relations, meetings, conflict resolution, networking, and all of those kinds of things. For managing the organization's financial resources, you have to think about revenues and budgeting and tracking resources and integrating financial with other indicators. And then when you think about the operations of an organization, you have 
the development and communication of standard operating procedures. Remember, standard operating procedures, the basics of management, preformed responses to specific stimuli. Then you use organization structure, who works for who. Then you have benchmarking, looking at other organizations and what they do. Then you have performance management and measurement, simply trying to figure out what the organization is doing to see whether your changes have any impact. Crisis management, sometimes you have to respond quickly to things that are thrown at you by your environment. Quality and operations management, that's where you analyze what, how we do work around here. What are the actual processes for uh, communicating with our suppliers, focusing on our own operation, and focusing on our customers, and then re-engineering. When do we knock the whole thing down and start again? So what's the concept of sustainability management innovation? Well, in the 21st century, we see society and the economy rapidly changing in response to new technologies. The pace of organizational change, the pressure on public and private organizations is growing. Innovation is needed then because of this pace. Economic, technological, social, and cultural and political change is accelerating. The, the political cycles are now measured in months rather than in decades. The technological innovations are coming at us uh, at a rapid pace. So this accelerated rate of change has challenged the traditional bureaucratic form of organization, the way that we did things in the past, which was basically stable, steady, and slow. Stable, steady, and slow doesn't work anymore because the environment we're in is none of those things. We are in a global economy that is rapidly changing, that is creating political and economic pressure that organizations have to respond to. And so that's part of why we're talking about innovation tonight. Organizations have to change rapidly to keep pace with the changes in their environment. What does that mean? They need to develop standard operating procedures more quickly. They need to take new technologies and put them in to place more quickly. And think about the first time you, well, maybe you, can, maybe you can't remember, but the first time that you used a Windows-based computer and you moved from DOS-based computers if you were a PC person. It was like, you know, and then every 18 months there was some other innovation. You had to relearn what you're doing. You might get used to one form of Excel, one form of Word. Before you know it, there's another one. And then there's another one. And you get comfortable in one. You don't even like the changes, but you better get responding to it. In a sense, that's a metaphor for how the economy is changing organizations. It's, it's really the same thing. So you have to, the technologies come in, staff has to learn new ways of doing things. New demands are made on people. Networks of organizations are replacing the old vertically integrated hierarchies. The company, you know, the, I think I spoke in this class about Ford Motor Company, the traditional hierarchy, vertically integrated organization that controlled every aspect of production. Now, I had lunch with the guys that are doing the Nissan Leaf, and this car is led by a multinational management team. It's being built in Georgia with a $1.2 billion subsidy from the Department of Energy, of stimulus money. Um, and uh, for one of the first times in Nissan's history, the new product is not being dominated by Japanese management. Uh, so, and it's being made by components from several hundred uh, different organizations. All have to be coordinated and integrated and brought uh, to the assembly line uh, without huge warehouses you know, holding on to all of these uh, parts as it's manufactured. National boundaries are less important now uh, than they once were. Organizations, corporations exist in multiple uh, countries and buy and sell in multiple countries. International cooperation is becoming more important because of the global economy and the global media. Um, but just the same, sovereignty is still a powerful political force in our world, and nation states are still incredibly important. And so we have this economic and technological world that is global, but we have a political world that's not. 
and that creates problems for trade, but it also creates problems for uh, sustainability. A lot of organizational reform efforts fail. Uh, partially, it's because people try to throw things together before they've thought them through, and partially it's resistance to change in organizations. The other thing is that these innovation strategies I'm gonna talk about, people think about them as independent cure-alls. So we do TQM, we do re-engineering, we do benchmarking, whatever the, the mantra of the moment is. In fact, you need to do all of these kinds of things. You need to understand all of these innovation tools because uh, they are only useful in different uh, situations. Consulting firms in particular oversell whatever it is they've developed. So there's lots and lots of examples of consulting firms, you know, who, by the way, are not always rewarded for solutions, but, they're, but they bill by the hour. That's an argument for complexity, you know, because it takes more time. Successful innovation, in my view, is often incremental and small scale. You try something, you see if it works, then you build on that. You try something else. Each organization is different and faces different situations and particular points of time. And so there is no one size fits all. There is no management magic bullet. Every, and whenever you hear somebody tell you there is one, that they found the answer, ask them how much they charge. So what are the key issues that innovation, innovators have to address? Well, the first one is how well do we know the basics of organization? What do we do around here? Okay, what's the basics of Columbia University? What does Columbia University do? Anybody here work for Columbia? Okay, so what does Columbia do? Yeah, what do we do here? Okay, I would argue we do two things. What do you think we do? Uh, educate and research. Yes, those are our two main product lines, right? Education and research. We create new knowledge, right? And we disseminate knowledge, okay? So it's pretty simple, right? So let's look at this classroom, okay? Is it comfortable? Eh. Can you hear everything you, you guys are all saying? Sort of? Sometimes? Can you see each other? So, sort of sometimes? What if this room was banked and semicircular and each of you had a little microphone at a table with an outlet for your computer? Sounds good, huh? Okay. So write to Lee Bollinger, <laughs> care of Low Library, and tell them that we want that classroom, okay? So you can imagine improvements, let's put it that way, but that's what I'm driving at here. You know, Columbia is very good at these things, actually. We're very good at education, we're very good at research. We're one of the best places in the world for those things, okay? But even this place is struggling to keep pace with the time and with the technology, right? So whatever organization you analyze, you have to ask yourself, what do we do around here? How can we improve what we're doing around here? Okay, why do we do course evaluations in these classes? Because I wanna know what you think. Why do I do exams? Because I wanna know what you know. Okay, why do we measure performance? Now it's an imperfect process though, right? I mean, we've talked about that in the first hour, how imperfect these indicators are but you have to have some metrics. So the question you have to ask as you approach innovation is who is our customers and what do they want? Because that's how you define quality. Now in the case of a student in a school, you're not just a customer, are you? I mean, I hate to say this to you, but you're also a product, okay? Because when you go out, you are somebody that this university produced as an educated person. And, and this is sort of unique in the customer service business, most of the people that want to buy what Columbia has to offer aren't allowed to. We have this thing called an admissions process, okay? And if you go to the Honda dealership, there's no admissions process. You give them your money, you buy your Honda, okay? In, in the Master's in Sustainability Management, or the MPA, Environmental Science and Policy, or SEPA's degree, more people, most of the people that want to come and be customers aren't allowed to we turn them down. So it's an interesting question when you think about the person as a customer. On the other hand, I want to think about the student as a customer because that's part of the dimension of the student because I want to make sure that I'm effective, that my programs are effective in educating them. And they're the only people who can really tell you whether or not something's working. 
Okay? Now, their employers will tell you also if something worked. But while you're here, I need to know what you're thinking. So that's something that I need to know. And then, you know, do we value in the organization creativity and out-of-the-box thinking or not? Um, you know, Columbia University has been here since 1754. It predates the United States of America. It has established a great group of traditions that provide that brand name that makes people want to come here. And so some of that is actually because of a resistance to change. If you go to Columbia College, they have something called the Columbia Core Curriculum, which is the same core cur curriculum they've had for over a century. Why? Because they think that that's fundamental to education. At the same time, last year they let us set up this program in sustainability management. Ten years ago, they let us set up an MPA in environmental science and policy. So they'll allow new things, but they also have some resistance to change. So an organization that's been around for a while has to have core values. It doesn't want to change just for its own sake, but it has to be open to it. So those are some of the issues that innovators have to face. One of the issues that a manager has to face when they do innovation is when should we accept the high organizational cost of radical change? Top down, let's just redo the whole thing. It doesn't work anymore. Then there's the make or buy decision. When should we have a contract to do this because it's not central to what we do? When has the organization's environment changed so much that we have to change our mission, our focus, and our strategy in order to survive? When should we use groups to do work instead of individuals? Those are issues that innovators have to ask. So let me go through a bunch of these innovation tools, define them, talk about how they work, and, and what their advantages and disadvantages are, starting with strategic planning. A strategy delineates the resources that are used to pay for specific activities designed to accomplish specific objectives. Resources, activities, objectives. How does it work? Well, typically, you start the organization thinking about who are we, what do we do, and what are the goals we're going to need in order to uh, generate resources. Strategic planning requires an organization to look at itself top down. It can be used to help build a sense of identity and mission within the organization. It can also keep an organization from rapidly moving from one side to the next depending on the priorities of the moment. A strategy can actually be an argument against being overly oppor opportunistic. Something comes up and you say, no, we said we're going to do X. So we're not going to do Y today, because otherwise we'll never get X done. And, and that's a benefit of strategic planning. The cost takes a lot of time and resources to do it. Sometimes the organization gets caught in a political and symbolic battle around its strategy. And sometimes, and this is one of the more interesting parts about strategic planning, by saying what you're going to do, you also say what you're not going to do. And that can then generate political opposition and internal opposition from the people who want to do the things you've decided not to do, because it means you set priorities. OK, the second one's re-engineering. And this is basically starting over and saying, we're going to do this differently. How do you do this? You identify the steps that add value. You eliminate the steps that don't add value. And you redesign work processes to emphasize speed, quick turnaround, and so forth. That's re-engineering. It's not easy to do. And very often, you have entrenched interest in an organization that will fight it. And then the other problem is, while you're re-engineering, who's dealing with the customers? Who's collecting the money? Who's keeping the organization alive? That's why this is a high-risk strategy. In the private sector, um, you've seen instances of this often accompanied before or after a lot of layoffs. Uh, in the public sector, it's often a reorganization where you create a new organization. So in, in New York City, uh, the Human Resources Administration used to deal with the foster care program, which is when children are taken away from uh, their parents because they're abusive or their parents die and they have to find uh, another set of parents for them. That's foster care. Okay? It used to be done by HRA. Now it's done by the agency, uh, a separate agency that focuses on children specifically. Why did they set that up? They set it up because a little girl got killed uh, by her parents, 
and uh, Rudy Giuliani needed political cover, and they created a new agency. Uh, Scapetta, who eventually became the fire commissioner in New York, was the first commissioner, and they developed a whole new set of standard operating procedures about how to deal with uh, these children. Um, that was an example of re-engineering in the public sector. But it's a high-risk strategy, and it can disrupt the organization. It's often done in desperation. It's often done when organizations have no choice because the thing is so dysfunctional, you simply can't keep going. Okay, then there's total quality management or quality management. This is one that I actually worked on I don't know, for about 15 years. I like it a lot um, as a fundamental of management. And let me just describe the process, because it can get pretty complicated, but I actually can make it fairly simple for you. The first thing is you work with your suppliers to make sure the supplies you get fit well in your production process. And by communicating with suppliers, you can improve the quality of what you produce. And let me give you a, a very simple example, two simple examples, one in manufacturing. So let's say I'm a blue jean manufacturer and I have three different kinds of blue jeans, and the cotton comes into my factory in one truck, and I have the, the, the factory set up to do, say, uh, khaki first, stonewash second, and regular denim third, okay? But the stuff comes in on the truck, and it's randomly packaged. In other words, I've got a couple of boxes of this, a couple of boxes of that. So the first thing I have to do when the boxes get in is I gotta take them to a big area, and I gotta sort them in the order that I'm going to use them uh, in my factory. Now, what if I talk to my manufacturer and say, here's the order I want you to load this in your truck. Now, they got to load the truck anyway, and they can follow your direction, but if I don't communicate to them, they don't know that's what I want. They don't know that that's my definition of quality. But if I do, I can save a lot of labor in unloading that truck. Service example, you get a spreadsheet from somebody with a financial analysis. The first thing you gotta do is redefine the categories because they don't fit into what your boss wants. What if you communicate with the guy who sends you the spreadsheet saying, here's the categories I really need? Okay, that's communicating with your suppliers. Okay, so that's the first part of quality management, communicating with suppliers. The second part is continue analysis, continuous analysis of work processes to improve their functions. Okay, so you look at how do we do this work here? You know, we, we set up for a meeting, and we always do these six things. And these six things, uh, there's often a delay in one of them. The guy with the coffee never shows up on time, okay? Or uh, there's something else in the production process where there's always an error or a breakdown. So you look at the error and the breakdown, and you say, can we do this any better? Is there a better way for us to do this? Classic example from the, from the Parks Department. Parks Department does two major things. They mow lawns and they pick up garbage. So parks department, guys pick up the garbage, they get their dumpster filled, they drive to the dump. This is back in the old days when we had a dump. And they don't mind because when they get to the dump it's four in the afternoon and there's a long line of trucks and they get to hang out and have coffee for an hour and a half while they're waiting to dump the garbage, sometimes for three hours. Okay, Nice for them not great for the department because they're paying them to sit around and wait for the dump. Okay, so what's the solution? The, the parks department invent, uh, invested in dumpsters. So now these guys don't get to go to the dump anymore. They dump the garbage into the dumpsters and then at three in the morning, another truck comes and brings the dumpster to the, to the dump. Okay, much less labor, much more efficient. And analysis of the process showed Here's where the delays. They pick up the garbage fast, then they sit at the dump for three hours. Okay, every production process has these kinds of features to it. Okay, so that's the work process analysis. And the third part is close communication with customers to identify and understand what they want and how they define quality. Quality is not necessarily what the expert thinks it is, it's what the customer thinks it is. And so you work to figure out what does my customer want. And lining those up, is what quality management's all about. By doing those kinds of things, you can improve uh, the management of an organization and keep them open to organizational change because they're always talking to their suppliers, they're always talking to their customers, and they're always thinking about how the work gets done. One of the biggest problems in organizations is that very often people accept the supplies as a given, okay? 
this stuff always comes to us broken. There's nothing I can do about it, okay? Or there's always a delay in this part of the process. There's nothing I can do about it. But what you do in TQM is you get the workers, the people who do the work, to sit down together and try to figure out how do we overcome those obstacles to production. What you want to do with these kinds of processes, by the way, is make it just part of how people think about their work. I wouldn't imagine a project where I didn't talk to my suppliers, didn't think about work processes, didn't think about my customers. The benefits of TQM is that it allows an organization to tap into uh, the knowledge that only the workers know. In other words, when you're looking at how work is done in an organization, the workers are the experts at that work. They know what's going on because they're doing it. Not the supervisor, okay? The worker. So how do you get them to tell you what they know? Well, first of all, if what they know is that something isn't working well and the boss designed it, you have to convince them that they're not going to be punished for telling the truth. But this kind of process is how organizations can change very effectively. On the other hand, if the overall organization strategy is faulty, a TQM can have the effect of improving the production of the wrong thing. It's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, okay? You know, the ship's going down, but boy, we've got the best looking chairs, okay? Benchmarking, very simply, is going around the world and looking at other organizations to do what you do and try to figure out how they do it and to try to take what, what they know how to do and bring it into your organization. I'm not going to go into great detail on this because we don't really have enough time, but what I'd say is that what you're trying to do in benchmarking is look at the best people in the world, the people with the best reputation, get them to let you look at how they're doing it and try to copy them. Okay? The benefit of this is it keeps you open to other models. You look at how other places are doing things. So I look at, when I'm, I'm very interested in waste management, so I look at other countries and how they do it because they're better than the United States is. I, I was at a dinner the other night where, where I learned that in Paris they collect the garbage every day. Okay, pretty interesting. In New York we don't. <laughs> okay, well, we have to leave something for the rats, no? Um, benchmarking is a very low-tech, low-cost technique and it doesn't disrupt organizations. Okay. On the other hand, it can limit your creativity because if you don't have a model for what you're trying to do, uh, you might say, well, it's never been done before. We can't do it. So that's, that's the one problem with it. Team management is simply getting people to learn how to work together. You know, this is something that is a kind of technology. How do you get people to work effectively in groups? How do they become good team participants? You guys have been working in groups uh, in this class, although we haven't trained you to do it. Uh, part of what you have to think about is how do I become a good uh, group participant? How do I contribute to the group and be somebody that are, is a sought after group participant? Um, what are the techniques that are available to me? And there are ways that you can train yourself. The key in group participation is being self-conscious. Think about how other people are viewing you in the organization. Now, in a good team setting, people set ground rules. Um, they think about different roles. They meet their work responsibilities. Okay? Clear goals, clear roles, communication. Training and beneficial team behaviors so that people know how to act with each other. How do I listen? How do I provide feedback? Uh, how do I disagree without being disagreeable? Those are all techniques that are increasingly important in innovative organizations. The benefit, of course, of team processes is that the tasks we're working on are complicated. You need a lot of different kind of disciplines to get things done. The problem with, with teams is that if the reward system in the organization stays individual, people will feel like they're being ripped off. I'm participating in this thing, but I see no benefit for me personally. And so it's important for organizations to develop some part of their reward system uh, around the, the group uh, and around the team itself. When the performance evaluation system and compensation systems are not modified, the teams lose credibility and people stop participating in them. Okay, outsourcing is what I call the make or buy decision, which is really what do we do ourselves 
what's central to who we are as an organization, and what are we willing to have another organization do for us. So at Columbia, you know, Barnes & Noble runs the bookstore. Okay? This is a good thing. We used to run the bookstore. Barnes & Noble runs bookstores. This is what they do. You know, Starbucks makes coffee. Okay? Columbia does research and education. Okay? Not so good. Food service, I mean, it's okay. I don't mean to criticize the food service people, but you know, let's put it this way. All things being equal, I'm going to a restaurant on Broadway, okay, before I go to the cafeteria, right? Okay. I'm going to Barnes and Noble instead of to the you know the bookstore run by the university. Okay, and on and on and on. So the make or buy decision, what are we good at? Now, on the other hand, I don't want Starbucks to run the class. Okay, and I don't rely on Barnes and Noble to run the Lamont Observatory. Those are things that we do, and we do well. And so an organization has to decide what is it that we're good at, and that we're going to invest our expertise in, and we're going to generate resources from. One of the things about outsourcing is that as information and communication gets cheaper, it gets easier to do this. You know, the invention of barcodes and the invention of the internet and personal computers and digital and personal digital devices makes it possible to be part of a global network of production for anything you can imagine. Okay? Now, there is this issue of carbon footprint due to transportation. And that's simply an argument for figuring out better ways of shipping things. Uh, with renewable energy. The cost, though, of outsourcing is you lose direct control over operations management. You have to rely on a supplier to provide you with things. And the skills that you obtain by doing something become lost to the organization. In order to manage something, you have to know something about it. So the person at Columbia who manages the Barnes & Noble contract better know something about the book business or they're going to be taken to the cleaners. Okay? Uh, Brent Millward, who's a, a management uh, scholar uh, at the University of Arizona, has written about what he calls the hollow state, where you can outsource so much and privatize so much that there's no management capacity left in the organization that knows how to do anything. And so that can happen. An organization has to maintain enough capacity to manage their contractors, to manage their vendors, to know enough about how to do it. And sometimes they, they get a little carried away with the outsourcing. OK. So how do you integrate these? All organizational innovation starts with a strategy. Re-engineering is an innovation strategy that you only do when your strategy says, we've got to start over again. You know? So take the US Steel Company. They stop making steel. Okay, take a company like Calvin Klein. Calvin Klein doesn't make clothing anymore. They brand clothing. They are a name. They stopped making clothing a while ago. Okay, organizations do that over time. They just decided that their distinctive competence was branding and marketing, not manufacturing. Benchmarking involves going and looking at other organizations, and quality management is simply constant focus on what the work is. Benchmarking, I think, should be part of any effort to innovate within an organization. Let's see what other people do. And every organization, as they innovate, has to think about what are the pressures we're under? What does the environment look like? Where are the resources? Remember, all of this is about generating resources for the organization. So let me conclude, and then we'll see if we can have a discussion of some of these things. Innovation tools and other management tools are the means that a manager has to influence the behavior of an organization. The organization's people and environment are always changing. Rapid change can cause stress within organizations. So how do you respond? Now, whether you're trying to bring sustainability into an organization or any other kind of change, sustainability is simply a form of change and innovation in the organization. And you should think about it the way you would think about any other innovation in the organization. 
The pace of change is increasing due to changes in technology and communication. Agility, creativity, and speed are more important than ever, and this is not going to stop. We're going to see more and more of this uh, as time goes on. And again, issues of water and energy and material and waste are simply new factors of organizational life that have to be brought in with the techniques that any management innovation requires. 